hello to everybody. It's really nice to be here. And um, I must say, before I start, a, a huge word of appreciation to everybody at Framework Media, Ashley and Casey and the team. Uh, what an incredible pivot to take this event online in such a short space of time. Uh, I know that we're, we're all very grateful for the opportunity to just carry on and do our jobs. And um, I'm looking forward to talking to you today in a slightly different way. But nevertheless, here we are. So my talk is about uh, unlocking some of the potential and the value of your digital content, uh, particularly by storing it in the cloud. Um, I'm a great believer in keeping things plain and simple. And so this is almost like a roadmap, a way to, to help you explore this space uh, and keep it in a really sort of simple story, which uh, will make sense, I'm hopeful. Um, a, a word of introduction, if I may. Um, obviously, I do work for, I <laughs> did found a, a company in this space, and I know that that creates a, a problem. Um, I want to give you my reassurance that what I want to share with you is not about our software, but it is just my experience in this space. I'm really passionate about the potential of digital asset management in marketing. And um, if I can share the motivations for that, some of the ideas behind it, then I feel like that will be a successful way of, of bridging this gap. I'm, I'm not speaking to you really as a vendor today. So um, shared storage really is the, is the core point of all of this. How did we get to where we are today? Let's go back in time slightly to what I would now call a traditional file server sharing system. Uh, in this model, uh, really we start with something which I'm sure we've all seen where you use a, a network shared drive usually, managed by your IT team. You probably have to be in the office or for a slightly compromised experience, you might be using it over a VPN if you're working remotely, which is obviously very pertinent now. Uh, so this environment builds on the, uh, the very well established analogy of files and folders. And the idea being that you would organize things into nested structures, potentially getting quite deep uh, in order to represent some sort of meaningful layout which represents your work and then we share it using the network. So that metaphor of files and folders is very successful. If we go forward to a time when we actually have enough bandwidth to do this and the cloud becomes a possibility, we can look at cloud storage services. Uh, for me this is, this is a very busy space but there are some really well-known tools out there I'm sure everybody who's, who's here today will have used at least one of these, probably uh, quite heavily. So this is taking the files and folders analogy and then moving the content into the cloud where we synchronize a local copy with our device. So our PC or our Mac has a local copy. This is pretty good. Uh, it avoids anything to do with network performance because you do have your local copy. And it also avoids uh, all of the dependencies on your IT team to have a, a well-managed, fast, backed-up system and instead allow the cloud to provide that for you. Big upside, you get much, much better user interfaces with these tools. And they're very convenient, almost self-explanatory. You know, nobody needs to have this stuff explained, which is great. Um, and they're very affordable or even free. So if you've got a small team, this is a really great middle way. There are some downsides. Uh, they're not that easy to organize. What tends to happen is that files and folders start to appear, but there's very little management or curation of where they appear and how they get cleared up or, or shared. And the problem with that is that as time goes by, uh, it doesn't address some of the more emergent, sophisticated problems that you're likely to see in a marketing uh, environment like workflow and particularly metadata. So, when we go forwards and look at what happens if you keep going down that route, then you end up with the ad hoc storage problem. So typically what happens now is that requests for things, I mean, content, marketing assets, the things that you've stored will tend to gravitate around the owner. There'll always be somebody who is assumed to be the owner of such a system. Um, and it is quite easy to lose things as you dive into these quite large and elaborate folder structures. Uh, it's also not necessarily a very good brand experience if you're trying to involve people who really should see things through your brand and not through, say, Dropbox's brand. If you lose things, then obviously there's costs because you're wasting your time, but also you may end up redoing things that really you could have reused if you knew where they were. So there's duplication, often quite a bit of unnecessary storage. Remember, we're keeping copies on every local device, so there's a, a multiplying effect when you add more people. 
Um, and there are some other risks there, which I'm sure you can see. Like, for example, what happens if someone shouldn't have access, but is accidentally left having access, maybe a contractor or an ex-employee. Let me just sum that up. For me, what it creates is this vague sense of unease. Um, I feel like it works, but it's not going to get better over time. It's going to get harder and it's going to get more difficult. So it naturally leads you to a progression away from it. But the question is what to do. So the third stage, if you like, in this evolution is digital asset management. Now, in digital asset management, we create a whole ecosystem. There's actually quite a dramatic increase in functionality at this point, because what we're trying to do is add functionality that solves the actual um, scenarios that you'll face and that will come up often. Please be assured, I'm not going to read out and explain everything on the screen. So just uh, absorb from it whatever you like. But the point is that uh, there are many different things that we expect to be able to do with digital media. The most important ones are typically to do with being able to find things, so search, uh, and also being able to share them in a way that is respectful of how they may already be used, or any limitations. And that in, in turn often leads us to workflow, which means things like approvals. So here we have a sea of functionality that is added on top of the cloud storage idea. In a, a normal digital asset management discussion, there's usually an idea that an asset has a life cycle. So in, when you're dealing with your content for marketing, you, you begin by uploading it, maybe there's some approvals. You may tag it so that it's searchable, and then you go on to use it, either by publishing it or sharing it or putting it into some other framework. Then you track it, you report it, and eventually it gets tidied up and archived. But there's an argument that this isn't quite right, and I don't necessarily believe it is quite right because it's put the files in the middle of everything. An alternative view is that the people are at the center, and it's their requirement to do things with the files, which should drive the whole life cycle of everything that's going on in marketing. So the creation is done by people, the uploading is done by people, and so on. There are a few more things to think about here, but essentially I do subscribe to this. You really want people in the center of your processes. So if we take that idea and combine it with the assets, then we end up with the, the digital asset management system with that sea of functionality, interacting with multiple people in different ways over different kinds of workflows. So we've personalized the work experience in that way. So here's a, here's a sort of, um, let me bring that to life for you. We've got all those features. We've got a joining piece of functionality to do with who they are, so their role, um, their permissions, and whether or not they need to get things approved. And on the right, we've got all the teams of people in very many different places in a business, um, all of whom have something to do with these digital files. So folks, for example, if you're in the social media team, where you may need to crop and resize, uh, send to social channels, um, obviously GDPR is an issue there. If you're in a creative team, you're much more interested in desktop tools like Adobe Creative Cloud and InDesign. You need to synchronize to your desktop like the cloud tools do. So it's a very different set of features, but these people do work together and the same file is shared between them both. So when we say digital asset management, what we're trying to do is say across any kind of profession, in any kind of sector, everybody in the organization that needs those digital content that you've got in the dam uh, really ought to be able to access it in a way that suits them and doesn't impringe upon anybody else. Uh, and that's the, that's the real core point of digital asset management for me. So you should get back the time. It should drive collaboration. So um, it's really hard in a short talk to really go through features. And I did promise you nothing of this would be anything to do with our product. But metadata is really a fundamental piece of technology, uh, of um, opportunity that comes with DAM. So I'm going to talk to you with a few worked examples about what that could do for you. I do think it's amazing. Sorry if I get a bit enthusiastic about this. Um, let's go back right to the 1990s when the Press and Telecoms Commission um, was working with newspapers. People like Reuters were moving images around newspapers and they defined for the first time the idea of embedded metadata. So say a, a file like a JPEG could have uh, content in text form embedded in it. And that gave us things like captions, keywords, copyright, and quite a lot of other things as well. 
So here we can see a simple example of a captioned keyword image. In the middle of the 1990s, more or less, the, the standard EXIF came up, which was a technical standard for cameras to store um, technical data like the, 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 the lens, the exposure time. Scanners could do this as well. And of course, with smartphones, GPS coordinates. And so now we can add location of things, which is a great opportunity. It means that you can find things in a certain region. In 2005, Adobe, as part of a consortium, produced XMP, extensible metadata. And this is a, a, a fantastic upgrade because it allowed us to invent our own metadata fields. So in this example, I've got a, a, a moth, which I saw in the uh, country park near our offices. And um, instead of just using a captioning keyword and somehow overloading that with information, we've instead created fields for conservation status, um, the distribution of where it can be found, the family, and even a tree structure, or really a taxonomy of where in the animal kingdom uh, this particular moth is found. So this really dramatically improved things for people in all sectors because it meant that we could personalize the model. Um, what, we, what we store, what we search suddenly makes so much more sense. Other things that you can do when you combine all of this is start to create really powerful searches. So in this example, I'm say, uh, let's search for something which is uh, not a listed uh, insect. Uh, it's within five miles of Cambridge and the photo was taken before the 1st of May 2014. With that search, I might be trying to identify whether or not that moth was ever seen before that date, for example. And consider for a moment that you can't really do that just by searching keywords and captions. It has to be this extra level of sophistication. So bear in mind that you can personalize things. I think that's the message here. In about 2016, although I'm going to say only really effectively from 2018, um, the world of computer vision and, and machine learning came to life and it meant that we could throw a, an untagged image into a computer and get descriptive content back, which was obviously a, um, a dream that we'd all had for many, many years before it really started to work. So in this example, there's a photograph of a flower which has been correctly tagged as a camellia uh, without any intervention. I think that's quite a brilliant improvement over having to know everything yourself or find domain experts to do all the metadata work for you. And it's really fast and really cheap as well if you're doing a lot of it. So here's another example of that. Uh, this is the uh, Scottish Parliament at Holyrood Park. And that's just a snapshot of the outside of the building. And it's been recognised uh, and tagged correctly as being the Scottish Parliament building. And that does, of course, include where it is with GPS coordinates. So again, saving lots of time by using automation. The other thing we can do is OCR. I do apologize for the choice of image here, but we've got some uh, people obviously enjoying a very fine bottle of Blue Nun. And as you can see, I've put a square around it. The, the text on the label of the bottle has been tagged correctly on the uh, metadata. So that now becomes searchable. That has some real great applications in um, uh, fast moving consumer goods and that kind of thing, where photographs can really add a lot of meaning. You can do translation. So here we have an example of a file that was tagged in Hungarian and that's been translated to English. This is really great when you're working globally. Um, not many Westerners can speak Mandarin, for example, but to be able to do this and collaborate quickly with language translations is an amazing improvement to our work experience. So it sounds great, uh, obviously metadata and in particular the computer stuff is really tempting. Um, there are some times uh, where it's still not perfect. Uh, here's an example of that. They're obviously goats in a tree, but the computer vision system thinks that those are birds, storks in fact, wading birds, um, and it, it really doesn't have that sophistication to deal with every single subject matter, and you will have to train it if what your subject matter is is so specific to you that no generic tagging system could know the answers. So a word of caution there if you will. If you know you need a dam, then I've got a few tips for you. Um, first of all, beware the pricing. Price is not a good indicator. Um, dams can cost anything from $2,000 to $100,000 a year, or even more if you're customizing them. Um, it may depend on quite a few things, but a really key point I must make is that 80% of what you get will be common to all of those products. Storing, sharing, repurposing, tagging, searching, even most of the permissions and workflow stuff really is standard. 
Um, so when you choose a system, it may not be price that sets the functionality in its entirety. The things you pay more for will be the services. So for example, custom uh, procurements and legals, end-to-end uh, -end integration with something very unique to your industry. So watch out for this, it's a big trap. There are some independent web resources which I highly recommend because it will save you a lot of grief. Um, if you Google digital asset management, it will lead to a lot of results because it's a very, very busy space. Um, so if you need to know pricing, for example, expect to struggle with that. Instead, using the, um, the Dam Federation website is a good idea. They're completely independent. They will not be paid for or sponsored, which is great. Uh, and they've got some great podcasts as well. So damfederation.org for that. Uh, you can also, and this would be more of the case for uh, organizational change projects where it really is ambitious and you need a lot of people to be uh, on board with your process and change towards DAM. Uh, you can get independent advice. I don't have a working uh, you know, relationship with any of these people at the moment, but they do have an incredible amount of experience. In fact, there's 60 years of experience on the screen. Um, they're very impartial, they're very good at weeding out vendors who are sort of not quite there, and they will help you build user adoption. I'll put this slide in uh, at the end as well so that you can get those websites if you need them. And um, the other thing, and this is really my final point, is about how to procure a system like this. Remember I said it affects multiple people. There are more than just a team of people who are going to use this. It might be organizational wide. So doing your research is a really good way to save time. Uh, you need to do that really before you start talking to vendors. Um, it helps you narrow the field, but it means that you're gonna get the right features. Remember that 80-20 rule. The other thing I have to say this, uh, do be careful to validate things. You know, if you're going to do a demo of a product, make sure that you see it really do what you're looking for, because there are, there are always problems with software in general not being quite there. Uh, and um, it takes a special effort to disclose what the problems might be. So get the vendors to do that in their demos. Fourth one, I'm pretty passionate about this point, but simplicity is so powerful and it's so valuable that it's worth putting an extra emphasis on wh whether or not your users will actually like the software. It doesn't need to be complicated to be successful, but it does need to be liked. And simplicity is what users love the most. So really watch out for simplicity. And that will lead you to adoption. If you've got a champion, your vendor works with you and your users love it, then a digital asset manage management system is really likely to flourish. And those are just the three key ingredients for me. So procurement tips there, and that really is all I would like to say to you. Um, but this really, I'd love it to be a conversation. I am around all day today in our room. And if you've got questions or you think I've raised something that is specific to you that you want to pick up, I'm here and I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay, let me uh, just unshare now and I'll hand back to Ash. Michael, thanks very much. That was brilliant. Really, really informative there. I certainly took some really useful tips there and I think it spreads wider than digital asset management. Some of your procurement tips there are brilliant for you know any type of software you're implementing, whether it be DAM or an ERP system, some sort of email marketing platform, they really um, ring true there. So some really good advice. We have received a couple of questions there that I'd like to just run through quickly. And like Great. I say, um, if anyone has any, if, if, if it pings any questions into this, I'll ask them on, on your behalf. So please do feel free to ask some questions using the tab, but continue the conversation on, on Michael's stand after this event. So Alison asks, what sort of timeframes are involved in a business implementing a dam system? Hi Alison, yeah, thank you for that. That's a really interesting one because it's going to depend on your ambition. Um, if you're working just within a team, so it's all about say the Marcoms team needing to work remotely efficiently, which might be a, a very immediate and pressing problem. I expect you could probably crack that quite fast. You know, within a few weeks, you could transform something which is feeling a bit messy into a, a shared tool, which you and your team can really use very effectively you're relying on the familiarity and the fact that you will work together. I think where it gets more complicated is where you start to connect different departments, some of whom may have just depended upon something they've always used. Uh, and that's where it starts to take more time because you have to go through demonstrating it, winning adoption basically, uh, proving it to users who just, as I said, are really only interested in simplicity. 
not making it one more IT project, that's a real risk. So um, we have seen projects that take years. Uh, admittedly, that's unusual. But I think an average might be something between three months and six months tops. I think that's where I would stand on that. Great. Um, and this next question coming from Steve links into something that I was particularly interested in. in um, will DAM ever be integrated into operating systems? Oh, wonderful. Yes, uh, I, I feel like we're going in that direction. Uh, that is a, a, a lovely sort of end state that I'd like to arrive at. So the problem we have with operating systems is that they are file and folder analogies and they're single user environments. And they do struggle because you have to remember that an operating system is built for home users as well. Uh, if you can imagine your own parents trying to use an OS which has got metadata and tagging and <laughs> there, are, there are issues. In fact, if you look at MacOS's Finder, at the moment it just uses a series of coloured flags, and that's the that's the labelling system that they use. And Spotlight does some things. I think it will always be a tension because the, the the needs of professionals, and they are quite domain specific needs we're talking about now, because it's all about the media. Um, I think it will be it will be a struggle for something really um, competent to find its way into a general purpose OS but the key will be connecting into that OS in the right way. And mm. there's a clue there with Dropbox doing that quite well. So I think that that's the future really for the time being. Brilliant, thank you. And um, with regards to how digital asset management ties in with maybe some of the other software applications that the audience are using in their business, uh, whether that be ERP, uh, some sort of marketing automation system or e-commerce, their website, can you give me sort of a rundown on how DAM plays its part and how does it tie in with those? Yeah, uh, maybe I can break it into two parts. Um, there's some nice integrations that are quite uh, well established now. Like for example, if you're using a content management system to power your website, when you're putting together an article or a post and you're about to put an image into it or some other asset, you can normally expect to find a plugin that will give you a button to push that lets you go and get that file possibly even serve that file through a content delivery network in the article. Uh, so that's sort of an, an end use, which is important because it prevents you from taking a copy out of the dam, putting it in some other system, and then kicking off a whole new mess. So that's one kind of integration, which is really important. And you can expect that to be quite widespread in popular features. Um, the other kind of integration and, uh, is going to be to do with API most DAM systems have got an API. The best ones will be really, really sophisticated and well-developed, possibly in, entirely made on their own API in order to guarantee that it works. And that plus metadata for me will get you all sorts of integration opportunities for more sophisticated things. Um, one that we've done with um, ITV, you, you know, when they're broadcasting is that they need to be able to track the transmission date of assets and they'll use metadata in our system to set the timing automatically from a broadcast tool. Uh, and it prevents them from accidentally using the same thing on a different show the very next day. Yeah. Um, integrations often do end up being API, but please don't be afraid of API. Um, things in the world of API have got so much simpler of late uh, to the point where it's much more plug and play than it used to be. That, that will be the, the answer to almost any generic integration. API. Okay, great. And um, you touched upon it there, but I think our audience would be really keen. You mentioned ITV. You know, have you got any other sort of standout brands that maybe you're working with or you know use this software to, to further their business? What sort of brands are using this? Yeah, um, so one, one of the beauties of, of being in our space, and something that I enjoy and it keeps me very you know, engaged with this whole space, is that it goes really broad. So if you name a sector, there will be a customer in it. Um, broadcast is a really exciting one because it's, it's sort of fast moving in real time. And ITV is a good example of that. Um, others that we've got are in sports teams. Southampton and Football Club is a great one. But they have a photographer taking pictures of each match, even the practice sessions. And when he uploads the photos, which he does directly from his camera, he tags the players' names as metadata. And as a side effect, without any more involvement from him, the, the smart behavior of that metadata causes it to appear in certain places. And the players individually have their own little brand portal. 
you know, I'm not saying anything about the nature of footballers, but they do love their own photos, <laughs> love to share them. Um, but that, that process is so much more um, straightforward because of the metadata joining the content to the player and then the player goes off and does the whole social media thing around it. Brilliant. So that, that one's a really exciting one. Yeah. I could go on for a long time. You don't really want me to do that, I suspect. This is a separate webinar. No, but it's, it's really interesting to, to know how others are using it. And it suddenly brings that software to life for me and perhaps some of the other audience members that are watching. But yeah. Yeah. That's all the questions that we've, we've got time for. Um, Michael, thank you so much for that presentation. Really, really um, insightful. I certainly enjoyed it. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of the audience that are watching at home. Um, Brilliant, thank you. And to the attendees that are watching at home, thank you for joining us again. Um, I'm quickly gonna show you, in fact, we popped a link in the chat, but just to sort of clarify exactly how people get onto the online event, I've shared my screen. This is the online event portal that we've linked in the platform. If you scroll down, about halfway down, you're gonna see third light stand here, and you can click on that and uh, click to meet here. And, and Michael will actually be manning that after this event, after this seminar finishes. So use the link in the chat, scroll down the page and click to meet with Michael and you'll be able to continue the conversation. And I'm sure Michael will be uh, happy to answer any more specific questions that you have. With I would be delighted. Yeah, thank you, Ash. I, I'd love to carry on that. And thank you so much for the virtual biscuits and coffee, which can carry on in that, uh, in the booth as well. Thank you. I took a sip of mine halfway through there, so that's all good. Right, brilliant. That's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for joining us again, and I hope to see you again at the online event at some point in the uh, in the near future. Well, thank you from me. Bye bye.